Thanks very much to the organizers, to Elhan, Eric, Ariel, uh, for putting this together. Um, and also thanks very much to Mike for really teeing this up. Uh, sort of, I think there should be some complementarities over what I'll be talking about and where, where Mike sort of took us to this point. Um, my objective today, I have about two and a half lectures to go through, is for the first uh, part here, the half of this remaining lecture, is give you an overview of how we sort of move towards applied or empirical work given the theoretical work that has come before. Now, Mike has done a little bit of that with Villas Boas and Ho, and we'll continue forward uh, with regards to bargaining. And then in the second two lectures, uh, talk more in depth about five particular applied papers, time permitting. Um, these slides, echoing Mike again, should be posted online. Uh, we'll get them up, so don't worry about trying to copy everything uh, you see into your, your notes. But a little bit of summary, um, recapping uh, what was covered. You know, bilateral bargaining in industry is pretty widespread. Uh, we've talked about retailer-manufacturer relationships, be it yogurt manufacturers and grocery stores, or you know, uh, uh, appliance manufacturers and Home Depots and Lowe's kind of stores. Uh, we have a lot of examples in healthcare, which I will get into: medical providers and insurers, hospitals and insurers, and so on. And a few papers later, I'll talk about with regards to content distribution. Uh, let's say in cable television markets. Uh, you have channels or content providers negotiating with distributors, cable distributors, satellite distributors, and so on and so forth. I mean, we can spend much time talking about examples. Uh, the reason we spend a lot of time talking about bargaining is because it really governs surplus division and to some extent also informs which supply relationships or contracts form. Uh, we want to understand surplus division because ultimately it's going to incentivize investment, or entry and exit, market structure why people merge or integrate or divest, and so on and so forth. And that's sort of going on in the background. You want to understand where you know, these tools are being used um, for, right? And it essentially allows us to evaluate the welfare competitive impacts of market structure changes, vertical restraints, uh, regulatory, and other policy uh, interventions. Okay, so that's why we spend a lot of time here. Now, as Mike sort of mentioned, many early papers have assumed that one side of the market makes these take it or leave it offers, an offer game or a bidding game, upstream firms dictating terms to downstream firms, you know, but in reality that doesn't match uh, what actually goes on. Contract terms, which often in implied work will be prices, but you want to understand that it need not be prices, this is about the contracting space, uh, those terms are often bilaterally negotiated. So recent applied work has moved towards richer, by no means rich enough to really capture reality, but richer models of negotiation and bargaining. So what I'm going to do today is discuss some recent applied work that have focused in bilateral bargaining models to vertical markets. What you should keep in mind as I discuss these papers, and I'll try to come back to these points, is you know, can these models be identified? As in, is there variation in the data that would reject simpler models? I always tell students, well, before we build more complicated models, can simpler ones do a good job of organizing the data? The answer is no. Well, that's a compelling reason why we add more bells and whistles right, to these models. We want to be simple uh, as much as we can. Right? And it's also important to understand what the limitations are. There's going to be a lot of limitations that are sometimes made explicit, sometimes more implicit in these applied papers. For example, assumptions on the set of contracting parties. Do we hold fixed who contracts with whom when we run our counterfactuals? Or are the contract spaces very limited? Are they just linear uh, tariffs? Are they two-part tariffs? Um, and are there possibilities for contingent contracts? Maybe not in our models, but in reality, maybe we see most favored nation clauses, or we see exclusivity clauses. And if they exist in reality, but not in our models, what are we getting wrong? Okay. And where can we push the literature forward? Again, things to keep in mind. So you know, a little bit of recap, a lot of theory has focused on these analytically tractable models. They were focused on when do we get efficiencies, oftentimes with one agent on one side of the market, one by n, n by one, with limited contracting externalities. Okay? And these applied empirical approaches have really been focused on matching many to many environments, governed by what you see in the data, and more general externalities. So I'll be talking about a couple of papers. Two of the earliest work in this literature are by Draganska as well as Phyllis Post and the third co-author, and by Ali and Greg Crawford in 2012. And those two papers, particularly uh, Ali's paper, you know, the 
later literature built upon. Right? Furthermore, there's a very tight relationship between this older literature and vertical contracting. As work in Nash and Nash has shown, you know, there is a connection between what's assumed in Nash and Nash and what's assumed in these vertical contracting papers, particularly with regards to beliefs, right? passive beliefs and things of that nature. Now, so far, you know, many papers have restricted attention to surplus division. So we use Nash and Nash bargaining solution concept to determine who gets what for a given fixed network of agreements. And we've examined either lump sum or linear fee contracts. Um, okay, and so can we maybe go further uh, in, in future work? So that's sort of a very high level sort of overview. Uh, here's what I'm going to try to do today, okay, in the later uh, lectures. I'm going to first talk about uh, a paper by Matt Grennan, uh, 2013. Uh, what he was looking at is price discrimination by medical device suppliers when they sell their products to hospitals. So let's think about two upstream firms. These are these manufacturers of stents. I'll describe what they are in more detail later. And they're selling to downstream firms. Okay. Now, what you notice in the data is that the same firm, upstream firm, that sells the same product may charge a different price to some other downstream firm. Okay. But in the model primarily, he's going to be looking at an environment where there's essentially these independent hospitals that don't compete with one another, at least not in the model, and they're contracting with many upstream suppliers. So there's no real downstream competition. This is similar to another paper by Garrison and Nouveau in town that looks at hospital mergers where they're looking at, in their main analysis, non-competing final buyers. Right? Okay? And they ask questions such as, what if we rule out price discrimination? What if everyone has to charge the same price to every downstream distributor? Or in a case of Garrison Green at all, what happens when a bunch of downstream, I'm uh, sorry, what happens when a bunch of upstream manufacturers merge? When do, what happens when hospitals merge? Okay, but that's sort of the environment we look at. So that's the first paper I'll talk about. The next two, uh, paper uh, with Kate and myself and uh, with a few people in this room, as well as Ali's earlier paper with Greg, um, are looking at environments where there's basically multiple downstream firms that contract with multiple upstream firms Furthermore, there's now going to be some other party involved, consumers, downstream consumers, for which induces competition among these downstream firms. Okay? That's going to complicate analyses slightly. It's also going to change the kinds of things we want to think about uh, when uh, you know, modeling, bargaining, and, and, and surplus division. Okay? So the paper with Kate is about insurance competition in healthcare markets. Mike did a great job sort of introducing you to sort of the craziness that is the U.S. healthcare system. I'll do a little bit more in terms of giving you some flavor. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, that goes on here is when you have competition, and I'll come to later, is when you think about disagreement points, it's no longer the case that disagreement means the payoffs to other parties sort of you can ignore, right? There's going to be much richer sets, uh, types of externalities we want to consider. Okay, so those two papers, maybe these two, the first hour and a half, these two in the, in the afternoon. And the last paper I'm going to sort of talk about is a newer paper uh, that tries to get at why insurers engage in selective contracting. So Mike alluded to some of these questions that were um, brought up in Kate's earlier 2009 paper. Um, we're going to try to sort of build on Nash and Nash to rationalize why it may be the case that insurers exclude uh, in the data uh, when maybe Nash and Nash can't rationalize that. And why do we have to sort of move to a different bargaining solution concept? And by no means is this a comprehensive list. Um, perhaps it's a little bit more focused for stuff I've written I can talk a little bit more about, but there's definitely a whole other uh, slew of papers that are being written and have been written. Okay? But it's still a developing literature, still a lot to be done. Okay? Now, when we sort of move to data, we want to sort of match theory and data this is sort of a typical approach, a structural approach applied to vertical markets. This is how I've seen things. Please, others, uh, chime in. Um, but generally, how these papers have proceeded is by first specifying an industry model, right, informed by institutional details, essentially the data generating process. Right? These models, when applied to vertical markets, have many components. One part involves sort of the supply side. And these supply side portions of the model 
you're going to have to sort of think about how is it that contracting parties are determined, right? First of all, we maybe take market structures given the set of upstream and downstream firms given, then who contracts with whom, um, how these wholesale or input prices are determined that are negotiated between upstream and downstream suppliers, then how is it that other strategic controls such as pricing to consumers or investment or characteristics, da 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 da, are determined, okay? By having to write down a model, you have to sort of be explicit about the timing, informational, contracting space, all these other assumptions. It's going to discipline, I guess, the conditions you're going to then take uh, to estimate your model and run counterfactuals. All right. The other side, the other part of the data generating process will be typically consumer demand. How is it that consumers choose to utilize or purchase both downstream and upstream products? These demand systems, owing to sort of a a long literature prior has, has have been able to be fairly rich and we spent a lot of time getting these details right because really if we don't have a fairly accurate estimate of how consumers choose products we're not going to have really great estimates for the incentives facing firms when they engage in contracting or bargaining and so on okay so the reason we oftentimes use a structural demand approach is so that we can predict outcomes for any potential set of counterfactual decisions by firms, not just those decisions we observe in the data. Right? We're going to have to predict what would happen to firms' profits if there was a disagreement, even though in the data we never see disagreement occurring. A structural demand system will allow us to inform at least some of the objects that go into those profits. Okay? Now, there are going to be challenges when we estimate demand in vertical markets. In particular, one of those challenges will be consumers who are heterogeneous will oftentimes select into different downstream products in anticipation of the upstream products that are available to them. So in other words, if we don't control for that selection, then we might get biased estimates of how consumers prefer these upstream products. So a lot of these papers talk explicitly at how you would account for those complications in estimation and in counterfactual evaluations. Okay. So if I'm going a bit fast, by the way, slow me down. All right. So those are these two parts. We're going to typically parameterize many of these portions by some parameter vector theta. And again, these structural parameters will depend on typically data availability and computational limitations. Right? This is applied work. There are going to be constraints that are sometimes not what you want to impose, but you have to. Um, and so essentially what we're going to try to do after having specified the model is estimate or recover this parameter vector to rationalize or match patterns that we see in the data, okay? And this identification is going to rely on a combination of both what data we have as well as the implicit theoretical or the explicit theoretical and statistical assumptions that we've made in the model. And finally, after we've have all that done, you have an estimate of theta, we can actually then run the counterfactuals that we'd like to. Uh, now, it's always nice when those counterfactuals you run are also informed by existing policy regulatory debates. Right? It's nice to give some empirical relevance to why we're uh, conducting this exercise. So that's kind of how you might want to see these papers and the trade-offs uh, that these papers make will typically involve one or the other here. Okay. All right. Are I mean, what are the assumptions that people make in the supply side and the demand side? With both parts. Yeah, both parts. That's right. Sorry. Okay. Great. All right. So before proceeding, I just want to spend maybe three slides recapping the Nash and Nash solution is going to come up again and again and again in these papers I cover uh, today. Right? It's been commonly used in applied work. Uh, originally sort of as a cooperative solution concept, there has been work to sort of provide some non-cooperative foundations to it. But essentially, here's how I want you to think about it. Here's sort of the notation that I'm going to sort of bring up again later on. So let G denote sort of the set of agreements that upstream and downstream firms have made. Okay? And let P denote the set of terms okay, of these agreements. Now, typically, P in these applied papers will be the price, the wholesale price, or a lump sum transfer. You can think of it more generally as Mike mentioned yesterday. 
Now, for any upstream firm I and downstream firm J that contract, the negotiated price PIJ, or terms PIJ, are going to be assumed under the Nash and Nash solution to satisfy the following problem. Right? They essentially maximize the Nash product of the gains from trade for the upstream and the downstream firm, where PIJ is the R max of P. And this being the gains from trade, what does that mean? Well, there's some profit or objective the upstream firm I is trying to maximize. This is his profit, given the set of agreements G that everyone has signed, and the terms. Okay? Plus, there's some variable X I'll get to in a little bit. He's going to compare this object to what firm I anticipates receiving if he doesn't have that agreement with firm J, and everybody else's agreements remains fixed. That's going to be uh, raised to some bargaining power, BIJ, and you have a similar object representing the gains from trade to downstream firm J. Sometimes for notation, we may sort of represent this as some delta IJ of pi IU. So you want to think about this as a difference in firm I's payoffs if we remove agreement IJ from the set of agreements G given by P. Okay. Yes? So, so the question is, do I should I repeat it or? Okay, the question was, um, we are only considering sort of the removal of agreement as opposed to replacing the agreement with alternative terms. And the answer is yes, we're considering sort of the removal and assuming that the actual uh, terms that are formed is essentially the solution to this. Okay, that's the implicit assumption. All right. Now, the key to the Nash and Nash solution concept, sort of the, the key sort of feature of it, is that if a firm anticipates there's a disagreement to a given agreement, uh, it holds fixed when computing its disagreement payoffs, it holds fixed the agreements of other parties when computing its disagreement payoffs. Okay? And this is why others have sort of alluded to the fact that this can be seen also as a contract equilibrium in the form uh, describing Kramer and Riordan. Yes? It's also holding fixed its agreements with, with other That is correct. As, uh, the, uh, the question was, it's also holding fixed its agreements with other parties, and that's true. So it's not just agreements involving yeah, other firms, but also all the agreements that these two firms may be involved in. That's right. So it also is a reason why some have sort of characterized national -Nash solution as maybe perhaps a bit schizophrenic, in that a given firm I, when he disagrees with firm J, doesn't sort of consider, well, if I disagree with firm J, maybe I can adjust my contracts with other firms K or M, right? But that's sort of how it's been defined and employed. I just want to stress one thing here. These objective functions, these profit functions, will depend on a bunch of other things, and that's why I represented this set X, this vector X. When there's disagreement, these, what I'm going to think of as non-contractual objects, things that aren't sort of specified in the bargain, may respond to bargaining outcomes. And what those X's represent could be things like other payoff relevant actions taken by the existing firms in this bargain. For example, let's say upstream firms and downstream firms bargain, and then subsequent to the bargaining stage, downstream firms engage in price competition. Well, if that price competition takes place after the bargain outcomes have been observed, then upon disagreement, we may think downstream prices adjust. Those X's may also represent decisions made by other non-contracting parties. For example, consumers. If consumers adjust what products they purchase after bargaining concludes, then also we might think that these X's might change. Right? So Nash and Nash doesn't necessarily uh, assume that everything remains the same upon disagreement. It's just that the things being negotiated over for other parties remains the same if there's disagreement. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So when we move to sort of uh, applied work, um, we're going to typically parameterize a model, as I mentioned, by some vector theta. And those, yes? So this would be the price conditional on an agreement, right? Yes. That's right. right. And oh. 
so I think the, qu the question was, um, when we move to data, how is it that we, we treat I mean, a disagreement? So, here, mm -hmm. for example, I can uh, estimate, I don't know, the bargaining power using the prices, supposedly. I mean, it's more complicated, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but this only uses the prices that they see in agreements, right? Oh, sorry. So let's just let's say they negotiate upstream prices, and let's say there's some downstream. I don't know. Let's say some downstream prices oh, five. Right, Who does? Um, uh, so if you give me before I repeat the question, maybe give me one slide, okay. and then perhaps re-ask the question. Uh, so I apologize. Was there another? Okay, so typically the model is going to be parameterized by some vector of, of parameters theta, um, and that theta will involve components that enter into these profit functions, these gains from trade, as well as typically include these Nash bargaining parameters. Um, we're going to sort of rely on theory and institutional details, as well as data availability to dictate what goes into each of these components of the model. Okay? Now, in turn, if we're going to sort of run counterfactuals later on, it means that we're going to have to have information about these objects, some which will be observed, some which will be assumed, and others that will be estimated. And how I sometimes think about categorizing these objects are in the following fashion. First, there are objects that enter into the gains from trade that is these pi terms here. You can think about these as revenues and costs. Typically, in many of these applied papers, many of the components that go into these profit functions will involve consumer demand, how demand responds to G. Okay? It's also going to have to rely on, if there's downstream pricing, some model of price competition, and maybe we have data on what those downstream prices look like as well. Okay, but we're gonna have to predict what they're gonna look like if there's disagreement as well. Yep. Uh, uh, just a question about sure. X prime. X prime, in a sense, is a counterfactual. That is. No, so, sorry. so that presumably you get from theory, right? Is that right? Yes. So the question was, the X prime there is a counterfactual. If we don't observe disagreement points, we're gonna rely on theory to predict what these X primes look like, and that's what you, for example, downstream prices or downstream data. Yep. That's right. So, you know, sort of says, uh, gives further reason to focus on getting the details sort of right at both of these stages because being able to predict counterfactual outcomes will come into play in many different places, including here. Okay. Now, the demand system, for example, will tell us where people go in counterfactual um, disagreement um, situations. Now costs, sometimes we observe, sometimes we're going to parameterize. Um, you know, so this is sometimes an object that we need to recover. Or sometimes we're going to assume it to be zero. If we assume, for example, cable television, the marginal cost of supplying a channel to an additional viewer might very well be close to zero or zero. Okay? And then there's another set of objects that you'd like to get a handle on, and they involve things that enter into the bargaining protocol. One is uh, Nash bargaining parameters, these Bs, as I've uh, written up there, and then these negotiated prices, which the difference between the papers I'll be talking about and the two you saw this morning, Villas, Boas, and Ho, is that actually these papers have some information on uh, what these negotiated prices look like. They could literally be the exact wholesale price that some given upstream firm I and downstream firm J agreed to, or they can be some summary of these contracts, for example, the average payment made to a given upstream firm. But there is some information about them that we can then use to help us identify the other remaining unobserved components. Now, you might think typically, you know, you need three of these four objects to get at the other fourth, or you can sort of rely on theory or parametric restrictions to make do with less data or less information. But obviously, the more data we have, perhaps the better things will be. That's how I would 
I've, I've thought about organizing uh, the approach taken by many of these papers. And lastly, perhaps, before I dive into some work, I want to give you an idea of how the Nash and Nash solution could be used to conduct some simple merger policy or merger analysis. Right? Um, this is sort of an example of why Nash and Nash has been also widely used because it's simple and tractable and it's very intuitive. Okay, so it's sort of an anchor intuition. Let's think about a simple model in which there's a single downstream firm who's contracting with upstream suppliers. So maybe it's um, a cable television distributor who needs some content to then resell to consumers. Okay? And in this very stylized example, let's say these two upstream content providers are quite substitutable with one another so that the downstream firm is able to generate 10 units of surplus if he has both pieces of content. But if he only had one piece of content, the downstream firm only generates eight. Okay. And if he has no contracts, or no content, he generates zero. Right. Now, if the downstream firm negotiates with both upstream suppliers and contracts with them, the Nash & Nash solution says that the price he pays each of these content providers will maximize the following Nash product where this would represent or the gains from trade to the distributor. Well, the question is, what happens if the distributor comes to a disagreement with one firm? Well, he still has the other firm, and he still would generate eight units of surplus. So he asks himself, all right, I get 10 minus 8, an additional marginal uh, surplus from contracting with the second guy, but I have to pay out some price P. And that guy I'm bargaining with, or the downstream guy is bargaining with, obtains P. Let's just ignore any cost of production and so on. So then you get a price of one under 50-50 Nash bargaining. Total payments made by the downstream firm to both content providers is two. Okay, so that's what the Nash and Nash solution would say would happen if the downstream firm contracted with both upstream suppliers. Now, if there's a merger, let's assume now you want and you two jointly negotiate with a downstream firm. What happens then? Well, what happens is that now both upstream firms can threaten upon disagreement removing both of their pieces of content from the distributor. Previously, when there was this agreement, the distributor still had access to the other guy. Now he has access to neither. So what's gone on here is we want to calculate the post-merger predicted price, is that the marginal contribution of content has now increased from just $2 or two units per provider to the full 10. And if firms get paid a fraction of their marginal surplus under the Nash & Nash solution, this means the post-merger price has gone up. Okay? And so it has a very intuitive prediction when you have a merger of substitutes. And it also has the advantage that when you allow for asymmetric bargaining weights, you can nest take-it-or-leave-it predictions. So if there was a take-it-or-leave-it setting, Prior to, prior to the merger, let's say upstream firms may take your leave it offers. I'm sorry, let's say downstream firms, sorry, let's say upstream firms may take your leave it offers to the downstream firm. Pre-merger, each upstream firm could extract $2, their marginal uh, surplus. Post-merger, they can extract 10. So again, you'd see prices increase, but, not by, uh, but more than they would increase under 50-50 bargaining. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Yep. So. I'm sorry. Any? Oh, so the question is what happens with consumers? In this simple model, I just assume these numbers are, just want to assume that they're, take them as given, and maybe they manifest from some unmodeled stage of downstream competition for consumers. But this is a simple theory exercise. Now, when you use a Nash and Nash model to predict actual mergers, what you want to think about is how accurately are we getting estimates of these objects here, right? You notice what happens to the pre and po post-merger price is a function of how much of a difference now is there in what the disagreement outcomes are, right? Given this is a counterfactual, well, we really have to rely on our theory and our estimates to believe the final outcome. 
Yes. So why the uh, payment is increasing from four to ten? So where this payment four is coming from? Oh, I'm sorry. So yes, the question is where does this four come from? It's because under take it or leave it offers in this simple case up here, you might think that each upstream firm is able to extract all of its marginal contribution. Because the other guy generates eight units with the firm, the second guy can only extract the additional two. So then this guy gets two, this guy gets two, total payments being four. Okay. All right. So I have five minutes before the break. Um, I guess there's two options. One is maybe I can give sort of a overview of what the paper that I'm going to talk about does before getting into details or just break and try to do everything after lunch. I don't know if there's a preference. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the first paper. Um, it's again by Matt Grennan, uh, 2013. The economic question is, well, in the U.S. healthcare system, medical devices are sold to hospitals by manufacturers where the prices are determined via bilateral negotiations. He's going to be looking at stents. So Mike alluded to these before. These are devices that are implanted into um, arteries after angioplasty. That is, there's a blocked artery. It's cleared up via some sort of balloon. And then to keep the, the vessel from collapsing in itself, you insert this metal kind of tube. Okay. A lot of money is being spent on stents. A lot of money is being spent on uh, pacemakers and other kinds of devices. They represent sort of a significant chunk of uh, spending. In follow-up work, by the way, Matt Grennan and his co-author Ashley Swanson are looking at uh, price variation across many different devices and, and products being sold to hospitals. And they document similar uh, forms of price dispersion. Yes? The first point, so why hospitals are paying different price for the same device? Is it differentiated goods or? So the, the question is why is there, I guess, price dispersion to begin with? Um, but there are many reasons. Uh, I think what, what this paper is going to try to understand is how much of that variation can be explained through uh, bargaining. Right? You're going to use a bargaining model to see if that can explain, I guess, the price dispersion. So when you think about a bargaining model, you want to ask yourself, does this hospital pay more or less because it values the product more or less than someone else? So, so mm -hmm. just to clarify, it means that the say, a company sells the same medical device to two different hospitals at a different price? Correct. So the question is, are these literally the same device? Yes. And the answer is yes, they are literally the same device uh, where one hospital pays a different price than another hospital. Now, in another of their follow-up papers, they're actually trying to explore maybe this is uh, evidence of search frictions or some other theory. Here, we're not going to have that. And we're going to see, well, how much mileage can we get just from a bargaining model? Okay. Yes? And when you ask what is the impact of enforcing uniform pricing, who is doing the uniform? Who is uh, imposing uniform pricing? That's a great question. The question is, um, when we think about this counterfactual, maybe the policy relevance, who, who do we imagine enforcing such a policy? I think there's a few answers. Uh, I think, um, again, given some of their follow-up work, they may argue for, let's say, if they believe this price dispersion is coming from price transparency issues and making prices public. Uh, it could be from a merger of hospitals or hospitals joining the same group purchasing organization who can negotiate jointly on behalf of all uh, hospitals that are part of that. So I think those are two ways through which we believe uniform pricing could emerge. Okay. And indeed that second interpretation is more consistent with how they model uh, the counterfactual. So the data that they use for this exercise is pretty neat, or rather Matt uses for this exercise is pretty neat. It comes from a market research firm, uh, which is a great place for price and quantity data. Uh, the issue is sometimes they don't like talking to academics, partly because we don't have the resources to pay uh, for uh, some of this data, which is quite expensive. Uh, but some institutional detail, there are basically 11 major stents 
These are 11 different products provided by four large multinational firms. This is 99% of total sales. Now, each of these stents, they have different sizes. As I've learned later, so the different sizes of the same stent sell for the same price to a given hospital. So, I mean, just everyone has different sized arteries. He sees prices and quantities, 10,000 uh, stent hospital month observations, bunch of hospitals over a period of approximately uh, of three years. Okay? And you see some quantity variation. So these are the abbreviations, bare metal stents. These are stents that are essentially just metal cages. They plug into your artery. Uh, one issue is that over time, scar tissue kind of starts growing around the stent and it gets sort of eaten up by the artery, which still can clog. There's something, these drug eluding stents are then coated by something that prevents the formation of scar tissue around them. So there's some advantage to these. Uh, they were more expensive. And as you'll notice, the sales of these guys kind of dropped off and the prices kind of fell over time, partly due to some negative, I guess, studies that came out that were later debunked. And he's going to have to sort of control for that shock in the estimation of demand. Whereas bare metal stands, you see sort of a more stable sales over time and a more stable price level. Okay. Now, there's going to be significant price and share variation. Up here is prices. Down here are market shares within hospital. We see he picked, I guess, eight different stents. Uh, they sell for approximately 1000 to 2500 each, right? And there's a lot of these things that happen every year. And in the data, you have a min and a max, pretty wide, a widespread. So the question is, if you control for firm, does it reduce the variation? This is within a given product. Yeah. That's right. Every product is sold by, oh, I apologize. Every, you want to think of a stent and a manufacturer as a pair. Oh. So every manufacturer produces its own unique stents that no other manufacturer can produce. Okay. I apologize for not clarifying that. Four and five are by one manufacturer, and six and seven are by another. Okay. Precisely. So these are literally, yes, individual uh, products that, that have no direct, I mean, perfect substitute. Okay. And down here, we see some market share variation. That is to say, it's not the case that one stent is, you know, just so much better than other stents. At least the data doesn't suggest that. It's because when we look within a given hospital, I'm sorry, if we look across hospitals, different stents are used different proportions of the time. Okay? So this perhaps is evidence that maybe there are some horizontal preferences. Maybe doctors like using the stent or they're trained with the stent. Or maybe you know, Johnson & Johnson sales reps took them out to nice fancy steak dinners and they like Johnson & Johnson products. Maybe. Um, but there's many reasons for this kind of market share variation. Okay? And so the last slide before wrapping uh, for lunch is given this is the economic question, given the data they have, you know, why, why might this not be obvious ex ante, the answer to this question? Well, there's some older theory literature that looked at what would happen if you had uh, uniform pricing instead of price discrimination. And it, you know, one of the key things to think about is the nature of uh, preference heterogeneity. If we think of stents as being vertically differentiated, some are just better than others, just cost more. Well, what you might have is that uniform pricing will lead to more intense price competition. In contrast, if the source of preference variation is primarily horizontal, this hospital loves stent A, that hospital loves stent B, just because you know, that's what they were trained with, then when you impose uniform pricing, you might actually get softer price competition. Each manufacturer of each stent might now, you know what, I'm just going to target the hospital that loves me and not try to win over business from the other one. Whereas with price discrimination, they were able to compete at these different hospitals. Okay? So it's a bit of a horse race, and it's also going to inform the things you want to think about when modeling hospital or doctor demand for stents. Because with that, without adequate richness, you may be presuming the answer you know, uh, indirectly. Okay? But this intuition is from a model with posted prices. Here, prices are negotiated. So that's another wrinkle he wants to control for. So we'll come back to this after the break. Thanks. And on, on this 